if this is your first day, welcome. Uh, just to give you a heads up, we, we really just go by what, what the Bible says. We look at Scripture, um, and we try to align ourselves with it. Last week, um, we talked about a similar theme as we are today. We talked about how the Israelites went into uh, the promised land that God had promised them. And they were going up, and the first thing they met was an obstacle. In God's plan, they met an obstacle, and it was Jericho was walled up. And God said, I, you know, I don't want you to fight. I know it makes sense to want to climb the walls and, and you know, pull out all your weapons, but I want you to do something. I want you to get me into it. And we talked about the Ark of the Covenant, where you know, God's presence dwelled back then. And, and so I want, I want to be in the middle of the march that, that when you walk around uh, Jericho and the walls came down. So it was a very awkward and weird way for God to win a battle. Um, and so I want to continue that kind of thing today. So I want, to, <clears throat> I want to show you a couple of verses in the book of Judges. What I love, man, don't get a Bible unless it's got a little cheat sheet in the front. God put that there. So if you don't know where it is in the Bible, you can just go there and it tells you. And we're going to be in the book of Judges. It's in the Old Testament. And from the very beginning of um, the, the book of Judges, I believe it's got something that can really help us out today. Uh, what I know is, uh, naturally, we're moving into a new season, right? It's, now it's, it's going to start getting colder and orange and all of that, and we're moving into that type of season. But we also move into different seasons in our life, don't we? And first it's school, then it's maybe you're in a season of marriage, or maybe it's a season of divorce, maybe it's a season of addiction, maybe it's a season of of whatever, man, you're trying to transition out of something and into something. And it's really hard to do, and we're going to see what the Bible says about that because, man, I think this book helps big time, helps us to come, uh, kind of go into transition uh, successfully and start to break some cycles that we've got that are self-defeating, those, those habits that we have. That, and uh, and I, th- I think this is good to help us stop repeating some of those things. So while we're reading today... I want you to look for God's faithfulness because everybody, every time you read the Bible, a lot of times we try to make it about us, okay? And I think God wants us to glean things that, you know, that apply to us, but never forget every scripture in the Bible is about God, okay? Every one. And so look for his faithfulness here. And most importantly, building off of what we did last time, the priority of worshiping God, okay? Maybe up to this point in your life, maybe it hadn't been part of your pattern to be at church, you know what I'm saying? Well, the Israelites, we can learn from them because they would love God one minute and praise Him and celebrate Him, and the next minute, man, is he's, the, he's the furthest thing from their mind, okay? So we can relate to this. We can relate to what's happening. And I'm going to have application points, and I call them that because application points are kind of like something that sticks, you know, application. And I'm hoping that th- these, these points that I make will point you to the Scripture that we study today. So I'm going to shut up and let let God's Word do the talking. In Judges chapter 1, verse 1, let's jump in. It says, after the death of Joshua is how it starts out. So Joshua is the name of a book that's just before the book we're in now, which is a story about Israel coming out of slavery in Egypt into the promised land, okay? And that's that's what they're doing. And Joshua, that, that whole thing was led by Joshua coming into the promised land that that God had for them, but this is after the death of Joshua. He's been leading them a while, and the Bible says that the Israelites asked the Lord, who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? We got another enemy, God. We hadn't been in this situation before, but here we are. And God answered them and said in verse 2, the Lord answered, Judah, gave them a, a direct answer, Judah shall go up. Uh, I have given the land into their hands. So I'm going to jump into these verses in just a minute. I want you to take notes. Okay, write it down somehow. Take a picture of the screen, whatever you got to do. The title today is Send Judah First. Send Judah First. And I want to show you that the, the question that the Israelites had as they were dealing with their own moving into a new season, their leader had died. They, they, they had always had a leader in place to help them in these situations. Um, so anyway, before we go into further, let's just pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word already, Lord. We, we uh, thank you that it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord, we know that it gives us wisdom and direction, God. And, and 
God, I'm praying that we would have hearing ears and receiving hearts, God, and um, just understanding minds, Lord, and obedient feet, Lord, to, to follow you more closely. So uh, we, we want to walk out what you speak to us today, God. So thank you in advance, in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. That means we're ready to go. Uh, so the book of Judges can be really odd when you read it. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of very strange stories. It's also a book of self kind of sabotage. You ever felt like that? Like, man, I keep messing my life up, my situation up. And, and where, where the people seem to take, you know, three steps forward and two steps back, sometimes more steps back. But here at the beginning, I do think we catch a glimpse of hope that we find of, of, and, and wisdom that we find in, in terms of how to deal with transition. How do we move from one season to the next, maybe like we never have before. Now we're inviting God in, and somehow God has um, uh, moved himself into our situation, or we've pursued who God is, and maybe these next attempts at a new season will be successful. Because that's where the people of uh, the, the Israelites were here in Judges chapter 1. So Joshua had died, um, and they're in this season, and they were used to be before Joseph, I mean before Joshua, they were led by Moses, right? Even if you haven't been a part of a church or read the Bible much, maybe you've heard of Moses. He led them out of Egypt into the desert, and he led them for 40 years. Okay, so Joshua had become their leader, and he was Moses' right-hand man before Moses died, and he, he led for about another 40 years, really. So for 80 years, the Israelites had somebody telling them what to do, and they did it, okay? Whatever Moses said, they did it, whatever Joshua said, they did it. But now they've got to deal with this new season where the people of God are going places they've never gone before, tasked with things that they weren't really prepared for. And under Joshua, they walked into the promised land and they overcame a lot of enemies because of his leadership, man. But, but they didn't, in, in a lot of the cases, when you read the Bible, they didn't finish a lot. They started things that they didn't quite finish, battles that they, they kind of won but didn't complete the battle. You know what I mean? And God had more land for them to discover, but it went undiscovered. So whatever the assignment was that God gave them, they didn't really complete it, okay? Uh, the things that they were called to do. They accomplished most of it, but not all of it. Um, so if we're giving a grade to the people in Israel during this season, man, in, in this uh, 40 years that we look at them uh, doing, trying to do what God's called them to do, they wouldn't get an F, but they'd get an incomplete. Y'all remember that, like third, fifth grade? Uh, incomplete. It's, it's not a letter grade, but it means... So I remember, I literally remember taking my report card to my mom, and it said incomplete. And my mom looked at it, and she said, incomplete? What is that? And, uh, and, and that wasn't good, because what, what that meant was is that I didn't finish everything that I was supposed to. Write this down or look at the screen. You, it means you have not finished all the assignments, okay? And that would be, the instead of a letter grade, back then you would get in, uh, what's called an incomplete. It's because we didn't finish what we were assigned. And um, uh, instead of failing this, God gives us grace. Men, sometimes God has called you to do something in this life already, whether it's to give your life to him or to, to be baptized, to, to serve, to give, to be a part of something. And something uh, came along that maybe was more important or distracted you or you, you chose it over that. And man, you just never completed fully the assignment. But God, God has this way of um, giving us that opportunity again. But here's the deal. Write this down. Some of us want to walk into a new season but without completing old assignments. I really wish you'd get that. Some of you are wondering, man, I need a new word from God. I need something fresh, something different. I'm, you know, I just can't, you know, whatever. But in most of those cases, what I've found is, why would God give you something new when you haven't completed the, the other assignments that he gave you? So, man, let's hope and pray, God, that, God, would you give me that chance again? Would you allow me to do that again? So in the book of Judges, um, is the time when people, uh, God's people are called to go back and finish their business, to go back and finish what was left undone, uh, to fight battles that they didn't quite finish because we're, we're seeing it unfold today. If you don't 
complete it fully, then it's going to come back to get you, right? So we've all seen uh, examples of incomplete work, right? Anybody drive 85 and 321? I mean, they're still working on that stuff. It's like it's, they get it incomplete. I just want to go by and say, all right, guys, put out the smokes, get back to work, right? It's just incomplete, and somebody should have given them an F, but it's, it's incomplete. So, um, so we've all got parts in our life where it's incomplete, you know, different areas of our life. So how do you tackle that? How do you deal with that? How do you make that right? What do we do? Because in Judges 1, uh, verse 1, the Bible says that Joshua is dead. And it goes on to say, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord. Now, it's at this point that the people start to seek and ask God what to do. What to do. And I find it really interesting here and, and very familiar, actually, because if I'm really honest, I don't really pray the way I do when all hell is breaking loose. God, I need you, man. Here I am and... Uh, it's all breaking loose in my life. And, and sometimes it takes loss and death and tragedy and adversity and difficulty in my life, man, before I'm... Then I start to seek God answers from God. And the people of God uh, could have asked for wisdom at any point. When they were do, having all those wins, they were winning all those battles, they could have asked for wisdom at any point. James 1.5 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, you just don't know what to do. You should ask God. Sounds pretty simple, but most of us neglect that. Because he gives generously to all without finding fault. He doesn't hold you against you. He's not like me. I'd say, where were you before? That'd be what you get from me, right? And probably from you. But God has no fault. He says he gives it generously. doesn't just give it, but gives it generously. And it will be given to you, it says. He's not going to hold back. When you say, God, I have no idea what to do next. I'm really up against the wall. Things are happening in my life. I don't know what I can personally produce to, to get through this, but I need you, God. I need your wisdom. But sometimes we don't really ask because we think we've already got it. We think there's a way to hustle out of that. I know people, so somehow I'll, I'll get out of this. Um, but when you think you have all the answers, you don't really have any questions. So you kind of live life like that, and you don't really you know, go to God with that, but... It's when you realize, man, you, that you don't know what you're doing, man, that, that sometimes it's on the heels of a loss, okay, heels of adversity and things, which I've, I've found that, man, I learn a lot more when I lose than when I win, okay? Um, I don't learn from wins. Most people don't. We, we celebrate wins, right? Think of your favorite ball team, man. You celebrate the wins, but you, but you don't learn from them. And so, man, that keeps us from wasting the... <laughs> Yes, exactly. So think about your Panthers. They're doing a lot of learning, aren't they? They're learning a lot. They're smart. E equals MC squared for the Panthers. But you go back and you watch. Man, we, we really stunk. My Florida State Seminoles, we went through a few years there. Um, and Because you start to look at it, man. You start to look and say, what is going on? We need to look at every position. We need to look at every coaching area. And we got to find out what the heck is going wrong, right? And that's what you do. And so the Panthers, man, they're, they're really doing that right now. But write this down. You learn from your loss. And as Christ followers, man, we got to get that, man. It, 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 a loss is not wasted. It's, it, it shouldn't be anyway. So you learn from your loss. People don't usually learn from wins, but they do from loss. In fact, man, if you, if you win too much, you start to think, man, I've got this, you know. I can just coast, things like that. And then that's part of the cycle that I'm sure that the Israelites had. They had won for so long, they just got used to winning. They didn't really need God because, you know, they were already winning. And, uh, but um, anyway, so the people of God are at this moment of transition here, and they're lacking their leader and... And they've never been here before. And the Bible says it's at that moment that they ask God. I want you to consider that. Instead of defaulting to your hustle and what you've done in the past, what worked, do like they did and ask the Lord. And I found this, that most revelation, the revelation that comes from God, takes place during desperation. 
okay? So if you're going through something, man, lean into God. Ask God what to do, okay? He, the Bible says that he does not hold back. He's not mad at you that you didn't do it before, and he's going to give it, and not just give it, but generously, right? And it's not because God's speaking more when you're going through adversity. Uh, I'm listening better. I'm more in tune, man. I need to hear from God. And it's, it's not that God's quiet when things are going well. It's that, man, if I'm not listening and I don't listen, I'm not asking, I'm not knocking, I'm not, I'm not seeking. So anyway, so maybe, maybe that means our losses aren't entirely losses, if you think about it. Things didn't go as planned. It's, things didn't go right. Well, man, I've got to be honest. It helped me to lean into God even more. So in the middle of all this, the people ask, the Israelites ask, God's people ask. People are connected to God. Ask a a really good question. They're seeking God. They're inquiring uh, to God. And here's the question I think is a question that all of us really should be asking. Uh, And here it is. is, Well, what's first, God? What's, here's the trouble I'm in. Uh, What should I do? What What is first? What do we do first? And I call this a priority problem. I feel like I've kind of diagnosed the, I've been at, at, in ministry a while now. I did seven years of student ministry. Um, and then it's going on 13 years of senior pastor. So, you know, I've got a long time to look back now. I still got a lot to learn, but to look back is when watching people drift away or fall off course or whatever, they have a priority problem, man. If you're taking notes, write that down. And the priority problem is, man, I don't know what to do first. I got a lot of options, okay? We all have a lot of options now on what to do, how to live this life. And they had a lot of options. They had 12 tribes of Israel. It wasn't just the Israelites. They were broken up into tribes. They had plenty of tribes. Which one of us, God, we got the Canaanites and the Benjamites and uh, uh, to that, that want to, they're flexing on us, God. Who, which one of our tribes should go first? Because God, it makes sense if this tribe goes first, God, because they're bigger and stronger. They've they've won a lot of battles. It would, on, on, you know, our way of thinking, this makes the most sense on what to do next. But you remember, they hadn't had to decide things on their own yet, and so they're. Uh, maybe you've got some things, man. There's a lot of things that you want to accomplish that are cycles in your life that need broken. And it just needs its back broken, finally. And maybe it's, man, I'm going to work out. I've got to get healthier. I've got to do that, man. I've got to stop eating so bad. I've got to start being nice to my spouse. I need to really start going to church, man. I really need to get out of this addiction, finally and once and for all, man. I need to be generous all of those things, because God, you know, I, I, I'm all about myself. It's all good, but it's like the menu at Cheesecake Factory. Do you know what I'm talking about? Cheesecake Factory people in here, you ever been? First service, I thought everybody in the world's been. Everybody raised their hand, but like one. But Cheesecake Factory, there's one in Charlotte, one in Huntersville now. I love it. It's great. It's tasty. But the thing is, their menu's got so much to choose from, right? It's like, Okay, you got cheesecake, because it's in your name. It must be good. But y'all, they got meatloaf. Y'all, they got lettuce wraps. They got bang bang chicken. They got, I mean, fish tacos, whatever you want. They've got it. I mean, you you got it's like reading a book when you get there. So take your readers and and a light, because it's a little bit dark in there. But you just read that book, and about an hour later you're ready to order, right? And so it's a lot, man. It's got almost too many options. Don't tell them that because I like having that many options, right? And they always, restaurants do this. They take away from me, okay? This Taco Bell right down here, they took Enchiritos off the menu, right? I'm taking my business elsewhere. The other Taco Bell, get it? So with the other Taco Bell, y'all got it? I got this. No, we stopped selling those. I'm like, are y'all serious? This is the whole reason I eat here. I didn't say anything. I just drove off, but... <laughs> Before a lot of us listen, we, we've got more options than we've ever had to, to move through things. But write this down. We don't need more options. We need better order. I'll make that make sense. The whole goal is so that you'll come in here every week and line your life up with what Scripture says. So you don't have to be tossed about with how you feel about things. 
It's a real symptom of people that say, I think and I feel, I feel like this ought to be. Man, we don't have to live life like that. And you'll see people that are arguing a certain point or uh, about the Bible, they're, they're, they're irritated. It's because they don't know what Scripture says, okay? So that, that's the whole goal when you're here. So this will make sense. Um, what I found is, man, just our life is out of order. It's just out of order. You know, our days and our schedules are just full of things. They're just out of order. Not bad things, man. Don't get me wrong, man. There's great things that, that people do, and it's not, not a bad thing to do. It's not a sin. It's great. There's some really good things. It's just that it's out of order, man. And, and there are parts of our life that are exactly like this. But here's the thing. Write this down. What Scripture shows us, it, it reads to us, is that God has always been a God of order. Okay? He understands this. He invented this concept. Okay? And I don't think that we take that serious enough compared to how much the Bible talks about the order of things. And everything that God does is is within the context of an appropriate order. In fact, the Bible shows us, man, if if we get order right, then everything else starts to fall in place. So the question here is, from the Israelites to God, is what do, what do I do first? What do I do first? Not just what should I do, but what, what should happen first, God? And, and throughout the Bible, we see this. I'm going to show you just a couple of places just to give you some evidence in the pattern of God. That's, that's what we always do is look for these patterns, the, how often something is said and referred to in Scripture. And let us... Start with the very, very beginning, which is Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God. That's how the Bible starts out, whether you've got it on your lap or on your phone. When you pull up Genesis 1, it starts in the order already. In the beginning and first is God. So at the start of everything, there was God. And letting us know right off the bat what God thinks about himself, Okay. Then God communicates to his people, man, uh, the, uh, the truth and the way that they relate to him through the Ten Commandments. You remember Moses? Some of you maybe have been a part of church before you have revolution. Maybe you grew up and you heard that. I didn't, I didn't start going to church it when I was young. I had to hear a little bit later, but I still heard it. it was that Moses, uh, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses to give to his people. And here's what it says in Exodus 23, 20 verse 3. I am the Lord your God. I'm the one that saved you out of Egypt. I'm the one that, you know, that brought you out of Egypt and saved you uh, from slavery. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. None of them. No gods in front of me um, or ahead of me because I'm first. So that's some of the first things he said with the Ten Commandments is, I know you're going to be tempted. You're going to have a lot of options. There's going to be a lot of things in life going on, a lot of stuff. And I'm going to bring you into promised land, but, but none of it comes first. First, it's me. So God takes this very, very seriously, right? And we're going to see how serious he does take it. And this is how Jesus in the New Testament, he affirmed the same theme, okay, in Matthew 22, verse 36. And there was this guy, he's kind of a teacher's pet. That, you know the guy in school who always asked the teacher a real, a real question right before the bell rang? Little punk. He's going to get beat up after school. No, not really. Don't beat up people. Matthew twenty two thirty six. 36. He says, Teacher, what's the most important commandment in the law? And Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and most important commandment. So Jesus is just going right along with what his father says is that he is first. He created you so that he would be first, God first. In the beginning, there was God, and he's saying, nothing else is above me, I'm first. And then Jesus comes along and says, love God first. All right, so there's a lot of options, but the order is everything, God first. I know all of us, man, we've got important things going on in life, things we enjoy, things we're responsible for. But the Bible, front to back, is that God wants to be first. So write this down. 
be a good thing, uh, thing to write down or take a picture of. Is God is obsessed with being first. He's obsessed with it. That's what he wants. So the people of Israel come to God and say, what do we do first? We're in this new season. We lost our leader. Uh, Joshua's dead. We don't know how to go forward. We don't know what to do first. And God answers them in Judges chapter 2, verse 1. And here's the answer that God gave. It's very, very important. And we'll give context to it so it'll make sense. He says, the Lord answered, Judah, send Judah first, which is one of the tribes. It's a, a group of people. He said to send Judah first. But it's not the last time that God will have to tell him that. If you'll let me show you, it's about 19 chapters later in Judges chapter 20, verse 18. I'm going to show it to you. It says, the Israelites, this is another time. The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God. They said, who of us is to go up first to fight against the, against the Benjamites? Last time it was the Canaanites. And the Lord told them to send Judah first. And here it is again. The Lord replied, Judah will go first. The Lord says, still Judah. I didn't change my mind. It's still Judah. The same thing I told you last year when you were fighting the Canaanites. Same thing. So sometimes we don't need to hear a new thing. We just need to do the first thing. Again, you hear people say, I need a new word. You don't need a new word. You need to go back and do what God told you to do the first time. So God said, send Judah first. Send that tribe of Judah first. That's who I'm picking. I'm telling you, you're asking me. I'm telling you what to do. I don't hold back. I'm going to be generous with it. And the name of Judah is very significant. It always is. The, the names in the Bible are always very significant. Always, always look it up. Hey, there's a funny name. What's that mean? That's a plain name. Let me see what that says. And it, it has meaning. It's not just a random name. It means something uh, in the language of original Hebrew speakers. So we need to know what it is. Judah means to praise. Literally, that's what it means. You can go Google and figure that out. Judah means praise. And so they said, what do we do first? He said, send praise first. This is getting real now. And they were like, yeah, yeah, praise, like worship, worship you. Yeah, we get it. No, for real, God, what did you really mean? Who, who do we send first? And, they, and, and uh, they started thinking, you know, I don't know, Lord. I've, I've got a lot of stuff. You know, we might say this, a lot of stuff that needs fixed in my life, and my money's messed up, my marriage is even worse, my kids are acting nuts. So what do you think I should do first, God? And God's like, for real, praise first. So write it down like this, praise is our first priority. Your worship of God comes before anything else. I, I would let you popcorn and stand up and Tell me what's so important, the most important thing in your life. And every time, according to Scripture, it says, that's awesome. But praise God first. Send Judah. That's the praise is the priority. God calls us, man, when we order our lives that we send Judah first in every area of our life. All the ones I just mentioned. So whatever you're facing, man, you know, the new year's coming up. It doesn't look like it's getting any sweeter. You know, we don't know what's going on, and you're going to wonder at some point, well, what do I do? How do I live this life now that things are changing so much? God says, well, we're going to put it in order. And you start with praising me first, because when you do that, everything else will work itself out. So write this down. Praise doesn't always seem practical people that don't know the Lord and definitely ones even if they have a relationship with God, you know, they've been saved and baptized, but they, they stop there. They're stuck in not reading God's word. To praise, to give God worship doesn't sound very practical. Like, shouldn't I get a second job? Shouldn't that be the answer if my finances are so messed up? They'll start coming up with all these other things. So praise isn't necessarily practical. You're going to have unbelievers in your life that they, they can't fathom that. That where is, that's, that's one of the third or fourth things maybe, if that's your thing. 
okay? But just to praise God and put him first seems to go against common sense, right? Uh, but I've found this. Write this down. God will often call me to do what is impractical before he does the impossible. I found that to be true. So I'll be praying for an impossible miracle and I, I, I'll be asking him to do something amazing. But I found that before he does it, something impossible like that, it has to, uh, he's called me to do something impractical. It's not going to make sense. For some of you, you're in a marriage relationship and they're not going to understand that, that, that order of things, that my worship. You know, we're, we're having a tough time, honey. Uh, let's just wor- worship God, okay? Not everybody's going to be on the same uh, page as you with that, which is putting him first. Let me show you a quick uh, story in the Bible. I'll make it real quick. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 2. And I want to show you uh, this one person, you know, what he decided to do. is He was a king. His name was Jehoshaphat. What a weird name. You get picked on with a name like that. But he was a king. And some, the Bible says in verse 2, it says, Some people came to uh, and told Jehoshaphat, Hey, man, something's coming. It's going to be really bad. It says, A vast army is coming against you. That means your future's in jeopardy. It's going to be bad. People are going to, on, on track right now to die. You know, there's going to be a lot of adversity and hardship. Man, it looks really bad, Jehoshaphat. And that vast army is on its way. And like anybody with good sense, he, he started to freak out. I mean, you can read about it. And in verse 3 it says, Alarmed, putting it lightly, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Okay, so um, he decided, man, I've got, I don't know what to do. I'm outnumbered. I'm outmanned. There's no way for us to win this. I'm just going to ask God about it, which was awesome. And that's a pretty good plan. Uh, so write this down. When you don't know what to do, this is the most duh application point I've ever had. When you don't know what to do, ask God. And as simple and as lame as that, simple as that sounds, people just don't bother. They come up with their own plans in life. They start to try to figure this out, push through it, work harder, do more. So God responds when Jehoshaphat does this. And I'm just showing you clips of what happened here. The text is kind of long, but you can read that at home. So Jehoshaphat uh, inquires of God. In verse 12, God responds and said, "We have." um, Jehoshaphat was saying, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. You know, we we just don't know what to do. God, I don't think we're going to come out of this alive the way it stands. Okay? It's like when a doctor comes in, man, and says, you've got this this kind of cancer. Right? Practically speaking, it, it doesn't look good. And Jehoshaphat was honest when he said, He said, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I thought that was pretty good. Jehoshaphat, that's his prayer to God. I don't know what to do. We don't. I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough people. It looks really bad, but our eyes are on you, God. And We always think of what we know to do, but the Bible, Bible says there's a way that seems right to man. It seems right. We talked about that last week. It makes sense. But in the end, the Bible says, that way leads to destruction. Because we're good at trying to make plans for ourselves. So write this down. The first step to wisdom is to realize you need it. So some of you need wisdom right now. This thing that's been going on with you, try to work it out yourself. Ask God about it. Ask Him. Realize that you need wisdom that can only come from God. You know, and I'm sure this, the future of the world, I mean, we can see it unfold on TV. It's, it's unfolding, man. There's going to be a lot of, in your life, um, enemies and adversaries and challenges that you've got coming. It feels like a vast army, whether they're health or relational things going on in your life or financial, whatever it might be. So what do we do? Verse 12 says, we do not know what to do. Go to God and say, I need wisdom. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. So God responds, and God loves it when we put our eyes on him and turn our attention to him. It says in verse 15, the Lord says, the battle is not yours, but God's, 
Jehoshaphat. He's telling them, hey, go back and tell Jehoshaphat. Go back and tell him it's not his battle anymore. It's mine. That's my battle. I'm going I'm to take care of it. That battle belongs to me. So when Jehoshaphat heard that, the same people that told him about, you know, the vast armies coming, this is what he did. This was his response to that, knowing that it's God's battle. Second Chronicles 20, verse 21. Jehoshaphat, the king, remember, appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him as they went out ahead of the army. I love it because churches are full of men, too many men with hands in their pocket during worship. And Jehoshaphat said, I need some men that are, are willing to sing and praise. And this actually lead the army, right? And that's impractical again. There it is. That doesn't make sense. They're going to get killed if they're on there, and that's all they're doing is standing up there singing and worshiping and dancing for God, right? It's impractical. So when, you know, a king's lining up, it was, it was very uh, noble to go out in front. I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll go. I'll be in the front. I'll be the tip of the sword here. And he said, and Jehoshaphat's basically saying, well, that's great, except you don't need your sword. I want you to get in the front. I want you to worship God. Because God told me, man, this is his battle. And what we need to do is prioritize him here. And I need you to go out and sing and, and dance or whatever it is you do to, to, to worship God. And the fight is different when God's involved, okay? So write this down. Man, if you really believe it's the Lord's battle, if you really believe that, you don't need a weapon, you need to worship. Okay? So... That is sending Judah first. That's sending praise first. Verse 22, it says, As they began to sing in praise, it probably looked weird. That's not a typical battle strategy, right? You usually go in with your swords and shields and you're attacking and yelling, you know, you know, trying to project your own strength. But as they began to sing in praise, watch this, not before, not after, but the moment that they began, the, the very first moment that they started to praise, that praise went first. The Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. So it says at that very moment that they decided to worship, and they started to win the war. They started to win that particular battle. But that's not practical. I know it's not practical, and some of y'all live in a practical world, too much so. Right? You, it just doesn't make sense to do that. You know, like, man, to give a tithe and to support the local church and what we're doing in the, in the community and, and to spend that much time at church, man, this is, I mean, y'all, some of y'all been here, some of y'all been here about three or four hours, you know, because you just can't get enough. You go to both services because the pastor's so good. No, but some of you have already been here a while. It took you a while to get here. You sat here and you got to drive back to wherever it is you're going. Okay? That is... That, for a lot of people, that's not practical. It doesn't make sense. You should be, that's your day off. You should be resting or going up to do, doing this or that. You know, that, that's what's practical. But at some point, you've got to be willing to put your trust in God's hands, man. And um, because, you know, if your weapon for your marriage, it's not going well, man, you, you, you know, you get to a place where uh, co- another couple's counselor is not going to help. Or your diagnosis with the, with the cancer, man. Another chemo treatment's not going to work. We gotta, what do we do there? It can't be our weapon. Those can't be our weapons anymore. We have to learn how to worship. God says, put me first, man. I'll fight those battles. They're mine at that point. They're mine. And here's God's promise when you put God first in Judges 1 verse 2. Judah shall go up, that tribe. And they're going to, it's praise first. I have given the land into their hands. It's already been given is what he's saying. Did you see that? That, that God connects your praise to provision. I'm not saying it's, hey, that's the whole reason I do that. But when we do praise God, that's what you were built for. Okay, that's why you were created is to worship God. And along the way, we get all these other joys in life. But our first reason we were created. And, and when we do that, God connects our praise to Providing for us. Watch this in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor God with your wealth, with the first, there's that pattern again, the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled 
and overflowing. It wasn't like a, a dollar amount on that or how many fruits that you did, but it was, as long as it was your first fruits. Because the first fruits are usually the best. They're not leftovers, right? Then your barns will be filled and overflowing. In Exodus 13, 2, another example. Consecrate to me, set apart to me all the firstborn males. And whatever is first belongs to me. Next verse says, Then when you do that, Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt. So it's connected to, he got them out of slavery. All right? Putting uh, God first got them out of slavery. In the New Testament, Jesus uh, again affirms this concept of putting God, God first. Matthew 6, 33. But more than anything else, Put God's work first and do what he wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. Okay, we know that verse. A lot of people that's been around would know that verse. And what the Bible is telling us is this. When I praise, he provides. There's a direct connection with that. It's all connected. And I've been at, at ministry a pretty good while now, but... But I've been at it long enough to see why people trip up. Their priorities are out of order. Almost 95% of the people that fade away from God, people that maybe it's not a fade away, maybe it's abrupt, okay? Something came in and became a priority. Something else became a priority. And so now you don't see them anymore. You don't hear from them. It's just not important. So whatever it is, maybe it's a relationship. This relationship or this type of relationship became a, a priority for me over God. So their priorities are out of order. And there's a real easy to see, man. If you like need, what do I use for an assessment to kind of see if God is the priority, the first priority, not a priority, but he's first in my life. Because our calendar and our budget reflects our priorities, right? So take a look. I wrote this down. Take a look at your calendar and your budget. What are the things you spend money on? Man, that's, that's something that's probably a priority, right? Something that you're doing all the time. Okay, whatever's the most on there is your, is your priority. My time and my treasure, what do you spend the most of your time doing? What's the most important thing to you? And then your dollars and your days, you know, what are you spending your days doing? It'll tell on you. It'll tell us all, man, what the priority is. And, and I want you to write this down too. And this is an oldie but goodie. Is if I'm too busy for God, then I'm too busy. Long, awkward pause. See, we need a regular cadence of worship. A regular cadence of worship. A, a rhythm talked about it a few times, man, that the Sundays are for church. There are a lot of ministry opportunities. I talked to these other pastors. They're just, I'm telling you, their jaw was dropped and what you all are, are have the availability to you to, to make a difference, man, in this community and in this world. But you got, I hope it's this one, man. If you've been kind of waffling, like I've been going here, I kind of go there, that's awesome. But at some point, you need to Put down your roots. Right? I hope it's here. Man, gosh. It'd be great. But it's got to be somewhere where you're planting and you're getting busy doing the work of God. Okay? If you're too busy, I hear it all the time. And people say, you know, I'm kind of busy. This is a busy season in my life. I get that. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty busy myself. So I understand that, but all I can hear is something else is taking the priority for me. Something else. And, and I'm not mad or anything. I'm more sad uh, of what they're missing out on God's best and, you know, the, the, all the things that come with getting things out of order. So, man, won't you find a place to serve, whether it's on a Sunday or during the week, that will help you get involved more and more with what God's doing in this church and in this community, right? So here's something to pray about. I never want you to feel guilty. I hate, I hate guilt. It's the worst feeling in the world. 
But there's a difference between guilt and conviction. Our whole purpose here when we come, if you come for any other reason, just because somebody nagged you to get here, if that was the case, that's not what I'm talking about. But our job is to get lined up with what God's Word says. That's why he reads the Bible too much. I'm just going to go with that. And, and, and God's not mad at you. He's not any of those things. Man, if you have had priorities that were uh, not as a priority, but have been first, have been first instead of God being first, man, it's a good time to hear it and adjust your life. That comes through what's called, it's a fancy church word called repentance. Just go the other way. Just go to God. You don't have to tell me a thing. I don't need to even know. God, I'm sorry I've taken you out of that top spot. And I just didn't realize it, God, but I hear your word and I read your word and I know it's true. And I'm going to go back to you being the first priority in my life, God, because I got a lot of things going on. I don't have the wisdom, God. I thought I did. I tried to have, you know, pull my wisdom from the internet or, you know, God, my friends that I've got, and it's just not working. So, God, I'm going to put you first as a priority in my life. And a good way to do that, number one, is to make sure that you have a relationship with Jesus. Not a knowledge of Jesus, but a, a relationship. Like, man, if you're talking with a friend. Because Jesus did a lot to, to initiate that friendship with you, that connection with you. Because the Bible says it's the only way to have a connection with God, His Father. He says it. He says, man, the only way to, to God is, is through me. Okay? Because what Jesus did, He went to the cross and He, with His, his own blood, man, when He was nailed with his feet and hands and the cross and the spit he was spit on all that stuff that was for you that was to pay your debt and mine and he felt the weight of all of it every person that ever lived the weight of that sin man if you receive that and you when when you do that man you get the holy spirit you get access to that the same holy spirit that raised him from the dead that power for you get that and he's going to help you he's going to help you overcome some of these things that you've got going on your marriage that just hadn't turned the corner addiction in your life you couldn't do it before because you didn't have the Holy Spirit well, we understand who God is and, and the battles that he fights because I can't win the battle he says Jehoshaphat don't even worry about it bro this is my battle now you came to me it's my battle okay? so we can be set free of these things man we can move forward in this life and act finally do what God's created us to do man it's so refreshing it is uh, it brings peace to your life some of y'all just really need some peace and, and the only way to really get that kind of peace is through a relationship with Jesus so man maybe God's pursuing you man he's putting people in your life and you keep running into things that you know are God he's trying to draw you near but it really boils down to your conversation with God from your heart to his says, God I just want to give up I'm not going to live this life for me anymore I'm putting that's the ultimate way to put him first in your life okay and God's going to start surrounding you with people and opportunity and strength to, to break those cycles and habits it's going to be great to watch I look forward to it man God's already trying to give you a church whereas this one or the one you're mad at you need to go back to because you only showed up because you're mad at them. God's going to allow you to have, to have forgiveness. Okay? So would you stand with me today? Man, I know it's almost time to eat, right? I can't wait. These people are, they're not mad at me for leaving these people. They're going to the back. This is our care room. Because we care. To provide care. They're there to have conversation with people that have questions, man. Like, I didn't understand what he said about this or that. Or I need somebody to pray with me. I need somebody to hear my story. That's what they're back there for. They got their signs in the back. And they, they got a way to give, them, give you some privacy with them. And they will uh, meet and pray with you. They'll set you up with, you know, how to be saved. They, they can pray that with you. Um, you can tell them about a decision you've already made about being saved. Uh, they'll tell you about next steps, man. Jesus said, hey, man, once you're saved, hey, man, it's, I want you to be baptized. 
Right? We love doing that around here. We just had 11 baptized last week and kind of got spoiled. We want some more. Right? We want to see God continue to move. So they'll help you with that step. Maybe you've taken care of all that. But you need to serve. You need to quit spectating and serve. They'll tell you how to do that. Okay? How to get involved in a Bible study group that we have. We call them life groups. Find one that's right for you. Right? So you can start to learn more about God. I mean, it's not that hard. It's intimidating to look at this book and all that's in it. But those uh, life groups make it a lot, a lot better to absorb all of what God has for you. So if you'll bow your head and close your eyes, man, I'll give yourself some privacy and everybody else around.